I've been like wanting to have a, a presentation like this for a long time um, and have been to you mining, one of the you mining guys in here, um, presentation and um, I'm fascinated by these machines and what um, people do to uh, create bitcoins. So I'm really appreciative to Blake and Dan who are going to actually do this presentation and um, talk about the machinery. Um, first of all though I'd like to introduce Tobin. Doma. Do you want to say a few words, Tobin? Tobin actually sponsored this event. Um, he's also the fintech guy at Shepherd Mullen. So if you've got any uh, queries or you need a really good attorney, Tobin's the guy to go to. Um, Thanks, guys. I don't have much to make, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay. um, so please uh, grab him after the event if you want to speak to him. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Dan and Blake. Great. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Daniel Edwards. So how we're going to do this tonight is uh, I'm going to start out with more of an educational presentation and then Blake's going to take over and tell you about his cool little Z9 over here and uh, why he bought it and what's, what's interesting to him as a consumer. A little bit about my background. Uh, I was previously an investment banker did a lot of fintech deals uh, here in San Francisco and all across the nation. I then went into the Bitcoin uh, crypto space and was mining uh, very early on and then formed a company in 2015 with a group of individuals. The company was going previously before 2015, started around 2013, but wasn't into crypto. And then we became the first blockchain regulated gaming company in the world. And then we became the first blockchain company to sponsor a major league sports team. And that was uh, Arsenal Football Club out of London. So pretty, pretty cool. We went uh, viral when the article went on the BBC. And uh, I think we got like 25,000 page views in four minutes or something crazy like that. But uh, it was a pretty crazy experience. And uh, I'm moving on to my next thing. But one thing that's near and dear to my heart is crypto mining. And uh, I want to tell you guys a little bit about crypto mining today. And we're specifically going to talk about proof of work. So if you don't know, there's two types of crypto mining. Uh, you have your proof of work and your proof of stake. And we're going to dig into those. Tonight, we're going to talk about proof of work a little bit more. But I think it's, under it's pretty powerful to understand what these two things are. And when you're playing with this machine over here and using it, what you're actually doing with it. So we'll start with the proof of work side. The proof of work side is what you usually do for Bitcoin mining. And what this means is a group of miners would take a machine like this ASIC machine, they would dedicate its power to mine a cryptocurrency. And then once they solve a math problem, which we'll get more into this, uh, they would be rewarded a new cryptocurrency, which in this case would be Bitcoin. So, uh, and I'll go over an analogy that will explain this a little bit better in a second. Proof of stake is not to do with these machines necessarily and trying to use them for mining, but staking your actual cryptocurrency on the network. And then as a result of the amount of cryptocurrency you hold on that network, you get it. So uh, that's super confusing. So I wanna use more of an analogy with the audience. So let's say Blake has uh, one coin, and all the front row has one coin. The second row has two coins, the third row has three coins. The, the people, and this is for proof of, proof of stake. The machine will look at, and most of this is done with a computer because it doesn't take very much power. The machine will look at who has the most coins staked on the system. Obviously row three, they all have three coins staked apiece. So the machine will pick row three more with the algorithm than it will one and two. The machine will also pick row two more than it will pick row one. And so the people in row one will earn more crypto or less cryptocurrency than the people in two and three rows. This is important because the people in row three just continue to get richer, if you think about it that way, right? They're always gonna have more than row two and row one, unless row two and one do something like go to a crypto market and buy cryptocurrency, and maybe you know this guy in row one buys another three, so now he has four, so he jumps to row four. So now all of a sudden, in the algorithm, the machine would pick him the most often out of everyone else. It tries to be random, 
but it goes off in the amount of coins that you have staked in the system. Now, proof of work is very similar in the sense of it goes off of my, the machine power, but not the coins that you stake in the system. So you stake no coins in the system. What you do instead is you take machines like this, and whoever has the most machines gets the dedicated, uh, the algorithm picks that machine to solve the problem. It's a little bit more tricky than that because what happens is these machines are trying to solve math problems. And it takes a lot, of, these are crypto, cryptographic uh, puzzles if you want to think of them that way. And the more machines that you have dedicated pointing to that pool that's trying to solve that math problem, the greater the chance of you having to solve that. So let's go back to the analogy with, with the chairs. If everybody in row one has one machine, everybody in row two has two machines, everybody in row three has three machines, the people in row three are still going to mine the most Bitcoin because they have the most machine power pointed at the network to mine those machines. Uh, you know, and something that can happen then is called pooling. So if the people in row one and row two pool their machine power together, they have a fighting chance against row three because now the pooling power of row two and one are three machines, and row three has three machines, so now it's an equal fighting chance. But as we'll get into in the presentation, that's not the case. Most of the mining power in the world is controlled by China, and it's controlled by Russia. And most of that power is, you know, goes to them for the hash power, so they end up mining most of the cryptocurrency in the world. So that was a very high level explanation. And now let's, let's dig into a little bit about why mining. So tonight we're gonna look at proof of work. So this is when you have to use machines like this to solve mathematical puzzles and problems to get rewarded the cryptocurrency. So just a, another high level look at what is a cryptocurrency transaction. We're gonna look at Bitcoin specifically. This just lets you know where mining falls into the process. So let's say Rob opens a wallet he scans that wallet because he's trying to send cryptocurrency Bitcoin to Laura. Then he, uh, it says transaction is pending. That transaction is pending because if Rob sends a transaction to Laura, a miner has to basically solve a mathematical puzzle to approve that the transaction is really truthful. And the reason that they do this is because if you didn't have this cryptographic puzzle that was solved, then there could be false transactions verified onto the network or tried to be. So in a sense, this is a way for people to validate transactions and make sure that they're actually truthful. So when they send this uh, transaction, a miner then goes to work to try to solve the math problem. And every miner in the world is looking to solve these math problems. And the first person that validates the math problem that the original sender uh, came up with and they unscramble it, let's say, I'm just trying to simplify this, then once that is solved, let's say Blake with his miner solved the math problem. Blake is then rewarded a small amount of cryptocurrency for solving that problem and then uh, he, he lets the network know this is a true transaction and it propagates to every other miner in the world and they all say, okay, this is a valid transaction and they add it to the blockchain. And so basically a blockchain is just a block of verified transactions. So let's say Blake verifies this transaction that Rob sent one Bitcoin to Laura. Now let's say, and that's one, let's say that's a part of one block. Now Laura sends that transaction to Dan. Okay, Blake or someone else again verifies the transaction and that's added to another chain. So you start to get this chain of proved transactions that can't be falsified. So simplifying things a lot here, but uh, the, the miner in this uh, equation, let's say Blake, successfully mined the, the, the puzzle, you know, got the, the mathematical puzzle done, and uh, he was able to get the reward. So this all seems somewhat easy. You know, you just, uh, in the sense of like, oh, set up a machine and get rewarded cryptocurrency. But it's definitely not that easy. And I think that there's three fundamental pillars of crypto mining, and we're going to dig into that. And we're going to go through a case study and say, does it make sense for me to mine? What does it look like to mine? And, uh, and then we'll have some questions. So the three core pillars of mining, in my opinion, are location, software, and hardware. 
So when we talk about hardware, that's a machine like what Blake's picked up here. It's the Z9 Mini, a very good machine from Bitmain. There's many different machines out there which we'll talk about. Software, which means when we go back to our analogy of people pooling uh, their resources, that could be a software program. So they're using a software program to pool their resources and then have a fighting chance against the rest of the world. Or you can go it alone and just try to mine individually. But usually that doesn't work very well. I mean, if we had to imagine that we're you know, playing a game here and I'm trying to pick somebody out of the audience, your chances of winning are one in whatever the audience number is. But if you're pooling, you know, just like with the lottery, you have a better chance of winning. So that's how I like to think of it. And that's how people think about it. And we'll go over a, a mining pool chart that shows that most people in the world that mine actually do pool mining. And that's because even if you get picked and the reward is smaller, at least you got a reward. So diving into the first part of the three core pillars is location. Now, location is really important, and I would say it's the most important key differentiator that you can have in the crypto mining uh, landscape. And the reason for this is there's three core things within location. There's electricity costs, there's climate, and there's geopolitical risk. So when you look at electricity costs, that is the number one variable within location out there. And what this means and why this is so important is let's say Blake is using this machine here, but he's doing it in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco, and he's getting charged a residential rate for mining. Now his, his rate per kilowatt hour could be, uh, let's say 27 cents or something you know, really high. And if his profitability from that machine is let's say, I don't know, 20 cents or 15 cents, he's losing money to mine. So it doesn't make sense. You know, this is just like a classic uh, return on analysis or, you know, an ROI calculation of what is the cost of mining and what is the profitability? And if you're making more than the cost, obviously you're making money. But in most places in the world, they don't actually allow cryptocurrency mining and it can be uh, a very big risk, you know, for you to do so. And they also, the Blake mining in his, let's say his apartment with one machine he has a residential rate for power. But if Dan was to go, let's say, up into Oregon somewhere next to a hydro facility and get, let's say, five cents a kilowatt hour, I'm already beating Blake, you know, in our, I think our, uh, we were saying 28 cents or something. I don't pay for electricity in that apartment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's got a cheat code. But uh, you're, you're looking for, you're looking at a pretty drastic difference. And so, Big, the price of, yeah. Yeah, median US uh, residential is 11 cents a kilowatt hour and median commercial is about four and a half cents. Yeah, so it's it's pretty drastic and uh, we'll, we'll go into that in the next slide. But you can see that if, let's say, a, a mining group in China is taking power from the government and they're getting it pretty much free, you know, their cost uh, hurdle is very low. You know, it's pretty much nothing, right? It's just the cost of uh, really buying the hardware and maintaining the hardware. And so if there's someone in the United States that has, you know, the cost of power plus the cost of labor, maybe even the cost of cooling down the machines, the hurdle rate becomes much, much greater. And so you need to know your electricity costs. And that's why you also see people not individually mining as much anymore and taking their resources and putting them together in big commercial warehouses. Because if you have many machines running at a cheaper cost near a really cheap cost uh, of power facility, it, you know, it makes a lot more sense. The other thing is the climate. So obviously uh, these things are computers, right? They're, they're basically glorified servers if you wanna think of them like that. And everybody knows that servers are very picky and you know they usually need to be in a, in a nice cool warehouse and nothing disturbing them, constant power supply. Well, miners are the same exact way, especially a special machine like an ASIC. And if you're mining in the Sierra desert, you know it's probably not a very great environment for a mining machine. Uh, so these, these machines are very picky. You know, they need to be in a very nice environment and uh, something that's pretty cool and calm and constant power supply. The last thing is the geopolitical risk. So it, let's say we're mining in China and China, as we know, isn't very friendly to mining. 
there could be a huge problem here. You know, the government, there's nothing stopping the government from coming in and taking all of your machines away from you and confiscating that. Uh, and in the United States, there, the government's been somewhat hands off for the time being, but there could be a time to where they say, we're not cool with this, or, you know, this isn't, uh, isn't appropriate. And they seize your machines. You know, Russia is, is very, uh, I would call borderline, you know, they, if they like you and you're dealing with the government, right, they'll let you mine there. But if something happens, you know, don't be surprised if they seize all your hardware and assets. So, uh, that's what I would say is make sure wherever you're mining, the geopolitical risk is probably pretty low. So if we dig into the United States here, we can see that California, New York are definitely the most expensive places for power on a residential scale. Uh, something that's pretty interesting here that we talked about just a little bit on the last side is make sure where you, you know you know where your competitors are and you know where you're at. Because if you don't know where your competitors are at, you won't, you'll never know your profitability for mining. So let's say if Dan is doing residential rates for, for power, but his competitors are doing commercial rates, his competitors are probably going to win because they have a lower commercial rate. So I'm already starting at a disadvantage. So when we, when we hear stories like people in Oregon and Washington going to hydro facilities and getting cheaper power, this is residential, so keep that in mind. So this is gonna be more on the higher side of the power costs. But I think it's a pretty good indicator that it shows you in the nation exactly where you would think the minimal use cases, you know, in, uh, in the Midwest and some of the Southeast and the Pacific Northwest, there's lower cost of electricity. And because of that, a lot of miners have been flocking to those different uh, geo areas. I mean, it's very rare that you find a, a big mining farm going up in uh, a residential or urban part of California or even an urban part of New York. Now, there's a lot of activity, I can tell you, in upstate New York. There's a, a lot of old power plants and coal facilities and other things that are abandoned that have been starting to be used, which is pretty interesting. But uh, you definitely need to know where your power is coming from and then also how friendly the, the governments are in that area and uh, how friendly the, the power companies are in that area. A lot of power companies in the Pacific Northwest, specifically uh, Oregon, border of Oregon, Calif or border of uh, Oregon and Washington, have been very picky on uh, what they'll let you do. So when they discuss, there was many articles in uh, a lot of the different papers, like the Oregonian and uh, other other publications that were saying the power facilities were really grateful that uh, miners were mining in these areas until they found out how much power they were drawing and then what the profitability of that mining was. And when the power company found out that they were getting power for, let's say, five cents and they were making 20 cents on it, they were pretty angry and they figured out ways like, oh, if you're doing this, we're going to charge you 10 cents or we're going to charge you 15 cents. So you have to definitely know who you're up against. And this was Pacific Power specifically. And uh, they have a lot of hydro facilities, what's called uh, the Columbia Gorge in between Oregon and Washington. And uh, pretty interesting, the battle there. And we'll see who wins. But uh, even, even uh, companies like Facebook and Amazon have put Amazon server farms there and Facebook server farms there because it's very cheap power. It's uh, relatively constant and it's pretty undisturbed because there's not a lot of population out there. So all of those qualities that would be good for a server farm location are generally good for a mining farm operation. So this kind of goes a little deeper dive into the mining and looking at the power costs. So here we can see this is the average, uh, as Blake said, it's, uh, you know, 11 cents for, for what you were quoting. Uh, what I have, the national average is, which is obviously dragged up by California and New York, is 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, the average commercial rate is about 10 cents. Uh, it can be much lower, it can be much higher. Uh, the average mining rate is around 6 cents. So if you're hitting around the 6 cents cost, pretty amazing. Like that's, that's it's going to be profitable for you for the most case given that you, know, you also have good geopolitical risk and, uh, and a good source of machines. The holy grail and everybody that I know uh, in, in kind of what I would call like more the elite mining uh, community that has big, big operations are going towards the one cent, two cent area. And that's because as more and more uh, people get into the game, I think the stat was like the mining, the hash power for Bitcoin went up 70%. I think uh, in the last couple of years, 
Uh, it went up fifty uh, percent in three weeks. Yeah. Uh, so as more people flood into the market, and let's say some of them are hobbyists, you know, like this machine is being used for. Some of them are commercial, where they'll take these machines and put a hundred, two hundred of them in a in a warehouse facility. They're going more towards this rate, I would say. I mean, you're not going to find many of those people that are towards the two cent area. So as people in the in the industry matures more, this gets kind of flooded. The, the real big miners, like the biggest in the world, are flocking towards this holy grail area to where they can see absolute best profits and maintain that they're in the top tier of miners in the world. So just spending a little bit of time on climate, uh, it's it, pretty obvious. You know, if you talk about some of the tropical areas, the Mediterraneans and some of the mountain areas, those can be really difficult for mining. Uh, the opposite kind of is said for the colder areas. Obviously, you don't want things freezing because that can damage machines. But we've seen a lot of facilities go up in uh, upper parts of Canada. Uh, Eastern Europe has been really popular. Anywhere where you don't have to pay for cooling. And this is a big component of it. So let's say that we're doing mining in Los Angeles. And as we know, Los Angeles has more of a... Uh, a warmer weather climate. And if I'm running this machine and it starts to overheat, just like a server or any other kind of computer would, I would have to cool that down. And so as I have to run a cooling mechanism like a fan or, you know, there's a bunch of different things you can actually mine in pools and uh, like swimming pool type things. There's a lot of different mechanisms to cool down machines, but uh, that's all extra cost. And so when we go back to that expenditures, profits, and if we're making money or not in that delta, you really need to try to drag down your expenditures as much as possible. And adding on another layer of cost to cool machine is doing something that maybe your competitors aren't doing. So generally you try to stay out of the areas that are orange, red, uh, and possibly even brown, and go for those areas that are more temperate, you know, green, and even some of those areas that are a little bit more polar, you know, which have a a uh, lower temperature. Just geopolitical risk real quick. Uh, the United States and, and some of South America, <laughs> Australia, and parts of the UK and Europe, they're somewhat legal, I would say. I wouldn't call them fully legal. I would say they just haven't been set in stone. You know, there's really no law in the book saying you can or can't do this. Uh, in some areas there are, but uh, for right now, it's kind of the wild, wild west still. There are definitely countries that are hostile towards mining, uh, parts of Africa, parts of South America. I would even put China uh, and, and Russia on the list of questionable. But as you'll see, most of the largest mining farms in the world are in Russia and are in China. But government connections and, and uh, briberies and other things, you know, make sure that those things uh, stay out of the hands of local governments seizing their assets. But as an American, if you're investing in a mining farm or setting up your own mining operation in a foreign jurisdiction like China or Russia, uh, you probably want to make sure that you have somebody local on the ground who's very friendly with the government and you know, your assets aren't going to get seized once you put up your mining farm and do all the hard work. So the, the, third, the second pillar is software. Uh, mining pools are by far the most... Uh, I actually put in here, most miners don't use custom mining software, but they do use mining software. So a pool, as we, as we talked about with our analogies, allows you to get a bigger or at least some piece of the, of the, of the reward as time goes on. And uh, custom software is more of something that some of the big miners do, but as, like a, as, a, as a hobbyist miner or as a, as a little farm, you'll probably join a software company that has created a pool that will put you in a pool with other uh, like individuals that will then allow you to to get a reward. So I would say that software isn't as big as location, but it depends on your needs. You know, if you're running a facility with, let's say, you know, 5,000 of these machines, it, maybe you need to think about a custom software solution that isn't just run in the mill, something that is a little bit more tailored for your needs. It also depends a lot on what you're trying to mine. And we'll get into that a little uh, later. So as I talked about earlier, there's a lot of consolidation. And this is where the problems with proof of work are kind of coming into play. So 
proof of work, the problem with it is if I'm a rich billionaire and I buy a ton of these machines and put up a mining farm in San Francisco, I can control a good chunk of the network and there's nothing stopping me from buying more machines and controlling more of the network. And when we think about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, really the, the thing here is, you know, it was sold on a dream of decentralization and that the people own the network. And uh, with the proof of work, a lot of people have said we're drifting away from that vision and that, you know, it's no longer this decentralized network. It's more of whoever has the money and can put up the machines controls the network. And so now you can see things like Ethereum and other other uh, protocols and coins are moving towards a proof of stake mechanism, which is what we talked about this, the point, the, the start of the presentation, where if you own one uh, Ethereum and you know you you can have a stake in the network. You don't necessarily have to go out and buy a machine like Blake did and, and try to do that. You know it's great and I I encourage that, but not everybody has you know a thousand plus dollars to to spend on a ASIC miner and then the knowledge to get it up and running. And so there's there's a somewhat barrier to entry there. But when we look at who controls the hash power in at least pools and this data is from mining pools. 81% of the mining pools are consolidated by Chinese owners. And, uh, you know, Russia is not very far behind. Uh, Iceland, Japan, all the rest of them, not really, uh, I should say Eastern Europe, that's very, very close to Russia, is the second. You know, it's China by far is number one. And then you have countries all around Russia and Russia included are the, the second. Uh, you know, a lot of them are broken out, like Georgia and you know Czech Republic and other things. But for the most part, it's Eastern Europe and China. And uh, the reason that they're so heavily owning the network is because they got into it early and they started putting machines like this up in very big warehouses and uh, and just really controlling the network. And think about this: the way that my my favorite analogy for the network of of blockchain is think of it like a residential property. If you live in a subdivision and you own a majority of the homes in that subdivision, you pretty much have control of that subdivision and you dictate the market rates of those different houses by buying and selling them. But if you own one house or one piece of property in that subdivision, you, you don't have very much control. And the problem is America hasn't really put a lot of effort or dedication into making sure that they're buying up, you know, quote unquote property of the blockchain network. And so when you look at the blockchain network as as a you know as a as a piece of land, it's owned by China, it's owned by Russia, it's owned by Eastern Europe. You know, it's not owned, it's very literally owned by America. And so if we think about blockchain technology and the the value of that going forward, we would want America to own a pretty good chunk of that or players from America to own a pretty good chunk of that to provide you know, safety and stability of the network. Because when things like this happen, where Russia and China control it, we're really at the mercy of those providers in Russia and China. And obviously the US has uh, intervened in a lot of different areas to where they make sure that other countries don't solely dictate something. And it's somewhat scary to me because if you think that blockchain is the future and it's another important network that could, you know, be vulnerable to attacks from foreign actors. Then, you know, this is this is pretty interesting. So, uh, it's uh, it's it's interesting to know. Uh, the thing that I think is is more important though is that there's really only 20 major mining pools in the world that control all this. So when we look at who is actually mining all the cryptocurrency or all the Bitcoin in the world, uh, we see that there's basically three major players that dictate the whole network. And this is really interesting because there's something called a 51% attack. And if you own 51% of the network or control 51% of the network, you can validate transactions that aren't, uh, could be uh, not true. So if 51% of this room were to get together and say, Dan did, you know, Dan sent all of his Bitcoin to us and that, that transaction happened. That you know could have not happened, could have been a false uh, transaction. But if 51% of the room get together and agree on that, they could put that into a block and say yes, that did happen. And so going back to my other slide about you know foreign actors controlling the network in such a big way, 
you could start to say, well, they could be very malicious on what they're doing. And so uh, it's pretty interesting that if these three mining pools were to get together, they could control the whole network and then you know, start start putting transactions out that they're not true. BTC.com and Ampool do uh, mine together. Yeah. So it, yeah. So what Blake's pointing out is that these two actually mine together. And so if you think about the fifty one percent mark, which is right here, uh, it's it's pretty interesting to to see like you know this this could definitely happen. And on I think on the next slide I I say who this this one is. I can't. Can't remember off the top of my head. This is not unknown anymore. This is a known uh, network, and it's from China. So these are all Chinese networks, <laughs> and so you can see that the top three who own or control fifty-one percent of the hash power in this are all Chinese networks. And I'm not trying to scare you from a uh, you know America first or you know uh, foreign actors are always bad because they're not. Uh, but it's just very interesting that any other you know technology that you would put up on a slide like this for let's say like you know bandwidth or other things america would be on this list and there's no american company on this list and to clarify that um, it's not to say that the hashing power is going straight to china there's a geographic distribution within these pools um, just the way that they're set up is you're accumulating a balance uh, via your reward on their pool and then they distribute it past a certain threshold. So there is some degree of, of centralization, uh, but there is a, a much um, a much more even geographic dis, uh, distribution as it represents. Sure. I mean, and that's a good point, too. I didn't do this. I should have. But if I were to put up a chart of banking transactions in the world and what transactions are going through what different payment gateways or payment networks, I assume it would look much, much more diversified than this graph. So it's pretty interesting that blockchain and cryptocurrency are preaching of this decentralization. But the data shows that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily owned by different people. No, most of that graph would be Union Pay, a Chinese company. They process most of the world's credit card transactions. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can go back and forth on on this, but uh, this is it, it's pretty interesting, in my opinion, that you know a decentralized network is you know pretty much owned fifty one percent by by three people. I just have a quick question. Um, so, is Hong Kong part of this? Um, are they considered Chinese or? Uh, coming out of Hong Kong too. For the, yeah, I think that in, I'm not 100% sure on this data, but uh, I, I think that China is encompassing Hong Kong in this. Yeah. But most of it is actually coming from mainland China. Yeah. Yeah. So going into hardware a little bit, and this is where we get to show off the ASIC miner a little bit. Uh, there's, there's really a lot of uh, options in the hardware space now, and we'll get into that. Uh, most of the hardware is pretty mainstream, uh, meaning that you know there's you're either going to buy from Bitmain or one of the other big uh, distributors out there. You're probably not going to buy from Dan's mining machines. You know, it's just uh, people don't really buy custom hardware as much. They tend to kind of go with the flock and buy what everyone else has out there. So most, in my experience, most of the custom hardware that I've ever seen built is for either very large uh, operators. And even those large operators will have a lot of mainstream hardware uh, out there that they're using, and then they'll test kind of custom hardware on the side. Uh, and what do I mean by the different types of hardware that are out there and available? So back in the day, uh, cryptocurrency mining started with CPUs. And what I mean by this is uh, computers. You know, so they, they started mining uh, on using computer cards and then GPUs. And for somebody who doesn't know the difference between a CPU and a GPU, think about a CPU as like an executive in a suit and it makes the decisions. It says, you know, you go here, you do this, uh, you process that. And the worker is the GPU. So the GPU is something that, you know, says, oh, okay, you need me to render this, this image or you need me to, you know, uh, download this you know, big huge file or uh, process this video or something like that. Something that takes more work is is something, and it's very complicated, is something that a GPU would do. So 
you can see that why CPUs were interesting in the first part, you know, there, if you look at just the clocking power that a CPU has versus a GPU, I mean, they can do many, many, many times uh, uh, more than a, uh, a, a, a GPU can do many, many more times than a CPU can. I mean, the difference when you look at the clocking, there's over an 800 times difference in the amount of power that a GPU machine can do over a CPU. So uh, mining quickly moved from doing CPU mining to GPU mining. And GPU mining can be done uh, basically when you buy, let's say when you buy like a classic laptop or a, a, a PC, it will definitely have a CPU chip in there. And sometimes it will have, but not always have a GPU chip. Uh, but most of the time what happens is people will buy GPU chips and put those in their computers to allow for better rendering of videos or you know play video games on them is is a, a lot of the early things. And so when when Bitcoin mining started taking off, the first adopters of this were gamers. And the reason that gamers were really into it is because they had a lot of these GPU cards and they were able to mine a lot more and profitably than the CPU miners. And once this kind of was figured out, they quit a lot of the or I would say pretty much all of the of the crypto miners moved to GPU mining, but there's been an evolution since then. And now the gamers say us. Yeah. So uh, uh, something to to kind of note, and that's where uh, Blake mentioned. Now the gamers hate us. So that's with evolution 2.0. So the next part of mining was GPU versus ASIC mining. So it's important to note that just like we talked about, GPU is a worker chip. You know, it's, it's out there to do many things, and it can do many things. It's very versatile, and that's the benefit of a GPU chip. An ASIC, which is just like uh, what Blake has here on the table, is a very dedicated uh, piece of hardware that has a sole purpose. And its sole purpose is, you know, has this algorithm on it, it goes after this one task, and it does that task. And so if you're trying to resell an ASIC, you're only going to be able to sell it to another miner. But with the GPU, as we mentioned before, they're really good at rendering video and other high uh, output functions. And so you can actually take a GPU after you're done mining with it and sell it to a gamer. And so as Blake said, what happened in the market is all the gamers got really mad because the miners started buying these GPU chips and the price of a GPU chip went through the roof. And so all the gamers were like, hey, where's all of our chips? And the miners said, well, you know, we'll sell them to you secondhand, but the price is much higher. Well, beyond that, you have uh, suppliers that are you know, directly distributing to large buyers who are going to be the miners. So there's not even the supply for gamers to get the top cards. Yeah. So what you started seeing is you would go to your local Best Buy or Fry's or something, and the GPU chips would just be sold out. And it would, this is like still somewhat of a problem. And there's there's been some some uh, developments in this area to where the makers of these of these GPU cards have actually made dedicated GPU mining cards, and then they've also made GPU gaming cards. And a lot of the big miners in the industry, they say, if you sell these mining cards to gamers secondhand and we catch you, we won't sell to you again. And so uh, I've been in situations like that to where I've bought bull orders of GPU mining cards and they've said, you know, if you sell these secondhand to gamers, we will never sell to you again. And basically they were cannibalizing their own sales in a sense because they were selling all these chips to these miners and they were really happy with it because they were making billions of dollars in profit by selling these chips to a newfound client, the miners, but they were forgetting their core client base, which was these gamers. And so it was uh, pretty interesting. So what's the ratio then of performance per watch? coins per watt. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't have that data on here, but the so the, the ace, well, it's it's much much more efficient. So I don't have the data on there, but I mean, I it, the thing is, you would never use a GPU miner if you were going after a certain coin, right? So I'll, I'll get in that in the presentation. There's certain coins that you can only mine with a ASIC machine. And there's only certain coins that you can mine with a GPU machine. And if you're trying to go after certain algorithms to mine up certain coins and you're doing it with a GPU machine, maybe you should be doing it with an ASIC machine instead because it's much more efficient. So the thing is, 
the reason why a lot of those miners went to GPU machines, which hopefully this can answer your question, is because ASIC mining is uh, with these hardware devices is much more efficient from a power standpoint. So the GPU takes a lot of energy and it takes, uh, this is when you hear all those articles in the paper about mining taking up a good chunk of the power supply in the world, even though it's fractional, but you know, it says, oh, mining is now taking up a certain amount of power supply as a small country. And that's all because people were mining on GPU mining, uh, with GPU mining chips. And so when people started to go to ASIC mining, they were much, much more efficient. And uh, this one is very versatile, like we said, but that, that one is even more of a soldier or an execution uh, machine. And so that one, let's say, and we'll get into it, if you wanted to mine a certain coin, you told that machine, like, this is the coin I want to mine, go for it. It would do that as opposed to a GPU mining machine, which is much more versatile and you can mine many different things with it. And it also has a higher resale value, but it's not as efficient uh, as the ASIC machine. (laughs) Yeah, ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. So it is specifically designed for running one operation and that is it. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting evolution. You know, you went from a CPU which is more of an executive and it doesn't really like to work. (laughs) And then you went to a GPU, which is more of a worker chip, but it's definitely like, uh, it's it's flexible, but it's not, it has only maybe too much versatile, uh, you know, uh, capabilities. And then you went to an ASIC mining chip, which was dedicated specific for that use. So uh, as the evolution of mining has kind of gone on, ASICs have kind of found the home as like the most efficient way to do mining from a lower cost of electricity and uh, and something that was kind of more straight to the point. So we'll go over the pros and cons of what's relevant out there in the market for the two machines today, which are ASICs and, uh, and, and the GPU chips. So some of the benefits of the ASIC chip is that it's very low power usage. And we talked about this compared to the GPU chip and the CPU chip. It's just, it's not even close. Uh, The power usage of a ASIC is much, much lower. And that's really the reason that it's used. Uh, Also, the other thing is that these machines have very high hash rates for specific coins. So when you talk about things that an ASIC can mine, let's pick on Litecoin, it's very uh, much more profitable to mine with an ASIC machine going after Litecoin than it would be something else because of just the way that this machine and this hardware is built, it's for that intended use. Uh, also the physical size of it. Uh, you, you, know, you don't really need a, a, a computer with a big GPU chip in it or multiple GPU chips in it. And uh, it, they're pretty, pretty efficient. You know, you, usually what you do is you take these machines, put them on racks and stack them and warehouses and you know, they're they're pretty small, as you can see, and uh, they can be pretty efficient. And the alternative is is mining with the GPU. You know, you have a bunch of computers lined up and trying to maintain and take care of a lot of computers. And then, uh, as we mentioned, all these traits give it a higher profitability margin than the GPU chip uh, for for some of the stuff that it mines. So, uh, because of its profitability advantages on power size and the algorithms that allow it to mine special certain coins, uh, it has a lot of uh, margin power in there that the GPU just doesn't have. But it also has a lot of cons. So it's, uh, it's, it's very high uh, efficiency and it's built for one specific purpose and that makes it kind of a one trick pony in a sense. So as we talked about with the GPU cards, you can kind of sell them and, and get rid of them somewhere else the only other person that's going to buy another ASIC miner is probably another ASIC miner. Uh, they're application specific, so they're only built for one thing. So, you know, this has gotten a little better actually with the new advances in hardware and software. But back in the old days, if an ASIC was built to mine Litecoin, it was only going to mine Litecoin. Uh, also, re- low resale value. We talked about this because of the versatile. Uh, the lack of the versatile capabilities of an ASIC machine, it tends to have a lower resale value. Uh, They can also become obsolete overnight. So what do I mean by that? 
if a coin chooses to change its algorithm and this machine is built for that specific case, it can it can be you know kind of rendered obsolete. Now, ASIC and, and other hardware manufacturers have been doing a lot to try to combat this, and they've been trying to you know figure out ways to where let's say Litecoin changed its algorithm uh, tomorrow, that a machine that was mining Litecoin wouldn't just be absolutely worthless. Because in a lot of today's world, if a coin changed its algorithm overnight, and let's say you have a machine that's like a 256 SHA uh, machine, and they, they change off of that algorithm, you could have to buy a completely different machine to mine that coin now. And that's, uh, you know, that can be very annoying. Let's say you, you, know, you drop a couple thousand dollars on one machine, or a couple hundred thousand dollars on multiple machines, and they're rendered obsolete, you know, you're, you're kind of out of luck. And uh, that goes to who controls that? Well, it's the manufacturer. You know, the manufacturer controls everything in the market of these machines and dictates really what they can do and what they cannot do. And if uh, they have a change of heart overnight, you know, it's the consumers are kind of uh, unable to adapt. And then, as we talked about with GPU chips, you can somewhere do some somewhat do software upgrades on them and other things, but. Uh, for the most part, the ASIC machines haven't really been like that, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But the ASIC uh, manufacturers really like you to hold a machine for a certain amount of time and then have to buy the new machine. Uh, think of it kind of like an Apple iPhone. You know, They want you to have that iPhone for you know, a certain amount of time, and then the latest and greatest comes out, and all of a sudden it's more power efficient and has more capabilities, and everyone has to have it. And uh, that that's exactly the same in this hardware as well. So if we look at the pros of the GPU miner here, it's a general purpose. And as we talked about, it's it's very versatile. It can do a lot of things. Uh, you know, you can pretty much mine a lot of the different coins out there. And if they were to change their algorithm or change other things, your GPU is capable of adapting as well. Uh, the nice thing is uh, because it's so versatile, it can kind of bend and break with the with the different changes in the algorithms of these different coins. Uh, it's also pretty easily sourced. Um, I don't know, Blake can tell you where he got his miner, but it's it's not as easy as going to Target into the electronic section and buying an ASIC miner. But it is that for a GPU miner. You can go right now after this presentation and buy a GPU chip at any of the top retail stores, and so it's. It's something that's definitely out there and available. Uh, the hardware is pretty standard. You know, you're not going to find something that's uh, super custom out there. Uh, GPU chips have been around forever. Uh, has a high resale value, like we said. You can sell to gamers. You can sell to other people, and uh, it's upgradable. You know, you you, um, you can get these chips and you can upgrade them, and it's not kind of just. Uh, have to buy another chip because the manufacturers come out and said they're obsolete. Now there is something to where maybe your GPU chip isn't as efficient as uh, a new GPU chip that they come out with, but it's not a big as difference as the hardware for these ASICs. Now the cons, the GPUs draw a lot of power. Uh, you know they're definitely not as effective as an ASIC, and uh, overall, just compared to the ASIC, they're they're not as efficient. Um, but that comes with the trade-off of uh, them being versatile. They definitely are very small. The GPU chip is much smaller than this machine, but it needs to go into a computer system to work, and that's also kind of the trade-off. Uh, and then the, uh, the other major thing that a lot of people don't like about the GPUs is that they can uh, only be used for certain coins and certain cryptocurrency out there. So in this day and age, it's really unprofitable to mine coins like Bitcoin and Litecoin with a GPU chip. So uh, that's something that with ASICs now on the market, you know, this the, the, you've seen a trend to where certain coins like Bitcoin and Litecoin and other things have, have gone to the ASIC chips. So I think it would be kind of cool if we went into a case study and said, uh, okay, that's great. You know, we have all this newfound knowledge of what the hardware is and what we need to look out for with the, the three core pillars, location, hardware, and software. But if we were doing this ourselves, you know, what would it look like and, and what would we need to do? So here I have a whole bunch of coins that are what we're calling desired coins. We want to mine some Ethereum, some Ethereum Classic, 
some Bitcoin Cash, some uh, Bitcoin, and uh, Monero, Monero Classic over here, uh, Zek. I mean, some of these are Bitcoin Gold, a lot of the, the standards that you would see out there. And so what we're going to say is that we own a little tiny uh, capital firm and that we want to invest $200,000 into mining software, hardware, uh, and, and uh, getting this up and going. So we're going to say that out of that $250,000, we're just going to buy hardware. You know, we've already got the software down. We've already got the location. It's a perfect location for this. And we'll get into power rates. So we need to dictate what kind of machines do we need to do this to get these desired coins? And then what will be the profitability to see if putting this $250,000 investment is actually worthwhile? So one quick note on here, uh, I didn't factor in mining pool fees and I didn't factor in difficulty. So one thing we didn't really talk about, but as more people get on the network, so let's, let's say that the first two gentlemen in the front row are mining and the rest of the rest of you start mining as well the difficulty rate of solving those mathematical equations will get exponentially harder uh, based on the amount of people that join the network but if people were to drop out of the network then it would get easier right because basically they want to maintain a, a pretty constant uh, difficulty power of how these coins are mined. And so obviously if you add more people to the network and you have more power to solve those math equations, they get solved quicker, right? And so you wanna to try to figure out if we make those equations a little bit harder, then the amount of time that it takes to solve those equations will stay pretty frequent. So that's kind of the, the, the whole uh, deal with difficulty, but I didn't factor that in because that's, that's, I would say that's for the next uh, presentation. And then uh, mining pool, is also not factored in, but you can think about, you're probably gonna be paying uh, two plus, you know, 1.5 to two plus percent uh, mining fees on top of all this, depending on who you're mining with. So let's go and look at the hardware. So a sister machine to this machine is the E3 Antminer. And uh, basically what I did here is I went on a really basic website called asicminervalue.com and that shows you uh, what's going on with the profitability, the electricity costs, and uh, most of this is in uh, euros, so uh, kind of have to adapt to that. But you have this basic, the basic, the specific, uh, specifications of the machine over there. So you can see that that machine draws 12 volts, uh, what it can do, the amount of fans on it that it has, the amount of wattage that it has, the temperature and the climate that it needs to be uh, max uh, capacity for producing and what this machine does and what it's best at. So it's best at mining Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And so here are kind of the stats. This is this data is a, a little bit old, but this tells us that we want an E3 machine because some of those coins on our list that we were going after were Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, and uh, a couple others. And obviously there's many more coins that it can mine, but uh, we're keeping it simple. So what we want to look at is what is the cost of the machine? So up here you can see that the cost of the machine is about 1,876 uh, euros. So the machine is pretty expensive for just one machine. Uh, then it's got a shipping cost of 150 and then it's got specifications in there for the electricity, the hash power it has, the earning per day, which is 7.64 uh, euros. The cost of electricity, which we're assuming in this scenario is uh, 0.08 euros. And so our, you know, it's pretty decent. You know, it's a little higher than the six that we saw on our chart on the first of the presentation, but it's not bad. And so this right here is called a sensitivity analysis table. And so what I've done is I've said, okay, here's our delta from the current price today. And if we go up, uh, if we go up 50%, these are the prices and the value of the coin. And if we go down 50%, you know, those are our scenarios. And then scaling out this way, I said, this is the price for one machine and this is the price for 100 machines, and our target is 35 machines. And so you can see that in our, uh, what I'm calling our base case scenario, which is the price stays the same for the cryptocurrency, we're making around 6.4 thousand euros. In the worst case scenario, we're still making 5.1 thousand euros, and in the, base case scenario, or in the best case scenario, we're making 7.8 thousand euros. So pretty cool that this tells us that, yeah, it's a newer machine, it does, does pretty much everything we want it to do and that it's mining Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. So that's pretty good. 
the next machine is Z9 Mini, which, uh, hey, look, it's right there on the table. <laughs> it's a new machine, and you can see that it came out in June, so it's, it's, it's very new. And it gets us uh, Bitcoin Gold and a, and a bunch of others, and it's uh, quite profitable. It's one of the most profitable machines that, Amp, that uh, Bitmain actually makes. So then skipping on, we looked at its profitability and what it can do. Uh, again, we, we look at this. I'm a little crunched on time, so I'm gonna speed up here a little bit. Uh, then we say, okay, well, what can get us uh, Monero and Monero Classic, these two coins right here, and that would be a Z, or uh, sorry, an X3 machine, and there's its profitability, not bad either. It's uh, one of my more favorite machines, and uh, running the sensitivity analysis on it, you know, not, not too bad, kind of in the same boat. And then uh, for looking at our Bitcoin and our Bitcoin cash, uh, that would be a uh, S9i. So uh, another machine that's very similar to the Z9 over here in uh, kind of size and, and capability, but uh, not too bad. It's a little bit more volatile, uh, and that's because a lot more people use this, obviously, if it's mining Bitcoin. So we look at the sensitivity analysis for this, you know, same, I'll have this presentation posted so you can look at it somewhere else. So we start looking at the best case scenario here, and we say that if we're running this machine at the forecasted profitabilities that we showed before, what are we looking at? So I have the total payments here that we're earning, the, the principal payments on the amount that we invested, the interest payments on that, if we assume that we took a loan out to get that, and then the total interest drawing down on the, the principal and the accumulated payback, we can see that if we run this machine for 10 months, mining those different things, uh, we reach profitability. So the delta between month 10 and month 18 is, uh, is our profit. And this is pretty interesting. Most people will tell you, oh, you can run a machine for 24 months. But the thing with an ASIC is that they're going to come out with another ASIC in that time. And so just like with the iPhone, it's going to be obsolete before too long. And so I really would say probably don't run a machine longer than 18 months. So my, that's why I put this in red. That's like your drop dead month. Obviously, if you wanted, you could continue running this machine pretty much until it breaks or until it becomes unprofitable. But uh, kind of an interesting thing here. So it shows us that if we invested $250,000 uh, in all this, then you know we're gonna be making a profit uh, a month of 52,000 euros and uh, you know uh, we become profitable in month 10. So pretty interesting. The worst case scenario shows that we still end up becoming profitable. And I guess just to show this, the total payback on this one for the best case was uh, 469,000 euros. So we made, we made quite a bit of money on this. Uh, it was pretty good. It was around a 90% return on investment. On the worst case scenario, we still make 25% of our money back, which is kind of interesting. And then, uh, but it takes us 16 months to do that. So the amount of profitability is only two months, not super great. And then uh, on the on the base case, which is the price doesn't change, takes us till month 13. And uh, we only have a couple months of profitability and it, it still made a lot of money, 56% of the money uh, return on investment was made. So, you know, kind of what do we think of that? These are a profitability table of the different analysis and, you know, the guidance is here that if you're getting electricity in the range of around eight cents, it's probably profitable in this, in this sense. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the scenario. I know I went pretty quick on all this because we're running out of time, but I want to have uh, Blake up here now and just to talk about, uh, you know, why he bought this machine and, you know, what he sees as like an owner of this machine. <laughs> I am Blake Richman. I'm a uh, partner and portfolio manager at uh, Nova Block Capital. We're a distributed ledger technology investment fund. Um, in my uh, spare time, I like to host nodes. I like to help with uh, decentralized file storage, and I like to mine cryptocurrencies. Um, I began with GPU mining, which was uh, quite profitable through 2017. Um, I did that on an ongoing basis with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, but then also on a speculative basis uh, with, with several different coins. Um, and this is typically where you're looking at Bitcoin talk forum announcements of the newest projects, 
that need to attract a community. They need to attract validators for their network. They need to ensure the security of their network through building this mining community. So they offer very attractive mining rewards very early. Uh, and these tend to be in the 10 to 100x of a stable mining reward range. Um, that type of mining, uh, you basically mine it and you hold it. Once the, once the price appreciates, the mining reward drops. Uh, project gets added to an exchange, then uh, you know it, it's significantly more profitable. Um, mining on an ongoing basis, uh, you basically are solving for electricity costs and market risk. Uh, so if you know how to trade, hang on to it. If you don't, you're probably selling it the second you get it. Um, mining itself is sort of a probability weighted, uh, almost game theory game. Um, where you're looking at what am I paying for electricity, what kind of hash rate, um, how many operations per second can this machine do, um, what's that general profitability, but then also what's the growth rate across the board on this network. So when this came out uh, about two months ago, um, I think first batch actually shipped in August, um, but they've been running before that and you see the hash rate for these networks grow you know, immediately. And that drops profitability for everybody. So what you want to do is try to get the most efficient machines that you can early in the life cycle of that machine. Uh, so that, that's what really drove me to, um, to buy this machine. Um, beyond that, it's the specific algorithm that it can, uh, that it can hash, and that's Equihash. Equihash is an algorithm that's used by Zcash, it's used by Zencash, it's used by Bitcoin Private, Bitcoin Gold, um, and, and a number of other currencies, uh, largely focused on uh, privacy currencies. Um, these currencies, you know, I, I think they have a, a pretty decent growth story. I think the enterprise application of uh, using cryptocurrency um, to pay your vendors, you know, private way so your competitors don't see it on the blockchain is a little bit more attractive of value proposition than Bitcoin. Um, so once I ROI this and you know sell and actually make it make the profit back, um, you know, those are gonna be more speculative uh, mining ventures. Um, happy to uh, I guess do a little demonstration. Um, this is the uh, Antminer Z9 Mini. Um, as I said, it's for mining Equihash. Um, it will do about 11, the, the label says it does 10,000 uh, hash per second, um, which means it's basically brute forcing this encryption algorithm such that the solution that it gets or the answer that it's uh, proposing for the network is sufficiently low. Um, and the way that they do that is by basically specifying the number of zeros uh, that you need to have solved the algorithm. Um, and the difficulty adjustment that Dan was talking about is basically how many zeros do you need uh, in, in front of that number. Um, this particular unit will have uh, three PCBs in here. Uh, you can see these, uh, these are old chips that are going to be individually powered. Uh, each one has its own heat sink, um, and then of course you have a 120 millimeter fan, uh, very loud and uh, powerful fan uh, to cool the unit. Um, this here is the uh, power supply unit, the PSU. These uh, six pins will plug into the board here, as well as each uh, PCB uh, within the unit. Uh, you basically turn it on, you plug in the uh, plug in the Ethernet cord, and you have to do an IP search for it. You have to figure out what, what its IP address is. You find that, you're able to just type that into your browser, and it brings up this interface that allows you to enter the address that you're basically pointing your miner at, the wallet, or if you're mining within certain pools, the account name that you have with them, and then a password, uh, which isn't actually too necessary with most, uh, most pools. Um, and that interface actually allows you to monitor the temperature, allows you to reboot it, allows you to upgrade firmware, it allows you to monitor hash rate, uh, real-time hash rate, average hash rate over uh, hours, days, it's variable, um, and then also the uh, pools that you do mine for. 
um, might have similar interfaces. Is that? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, just any questions? So, can I suggest that maybe uh, we've got networking now for half an hour? So, I might talk to Dan and uh, Blake and ask questions. Welcome. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.